public-private partnerships. How can PPPs deliver better services? Value for money. Key concepts and considerations. Good morning. My name is James Banningall, and I'm here to talk to you about value for money. In fact, uh, in the next 15 minutes, you are going to become absolute experts on value for money. Impossible? Well, let's see. The reason why I say that you'll become experts is that at heart, we all really know what value for money means, but we sometimes have difficulty describing it. So I'm going to tell you a little story to bring out the key concepts in value for money. And you can apply this in your everyday life as well as you can apply it in your projects. In fact, we'll start off with a story from everyday life. You're walking down the street on a beautiful sunny day, obviously not London, which is where we are at the moment, um, and you come across a Rolls-Royce showroom. And in that showroom is a Rolls-Royce car, and it has a price tag of £1,000 on it. That looks like good value for money. But wait a minute. You walk on another block and you come to another car showroom and it has another Rolls Royce in it and that has a price tag of £500 on it. What does that tell you? Well, the first thing it tells you is that value for money is a relative concept. It's a comparative tool. Nothing is good value for money on its own. It's only in comparison to something else. So whenever we do value for money, we test different options and we see which one represents best value for money. But of those two, the thousand pounds and the 500 pounds, which is better value for money? 500 pounds, do I hear you say? Well, maybe, or maybe you've fallen into the first value for money trap. And that is that value for money is not cheapest price. And what you've just chosen is cheapest price. So what do you need to know about that car? You go in, you talk to the showman, and you immediately see it's not a real Rolls Royce. It's an imitation. The quality isn't as good. So which is better value for money? Well, maybe the first one. Because what you're looking at is a combination of price and quality. That is the heart of value for money. But it's not actually quite as simple as that either. Let's say the second car showman says to you, I'll tell you what, I'm going to throw in a one-year warranty. Anything goes wrong on this car in the first year, we will repair it. Uh, that sounds like quite a good deal. Will that tip the balance? Well, what it shows you is that as well as price, you need to take into account risk. And risk has a value that one year warranty is worth something. It might tip the balance, but it doesn't. You're hard nosed, you say, look, I know this sort of building material you've used here, it's not adequate. I'm gonna go with the Rolls Royce because that will last me 20 years. And finally, the showroom man says, okay, I'll give you a 20 year warranty. Um, I will repair this car if it goes wrong at any time over the next 20 years. Now, that tells you another key thing about value for money. And that is that you should look at it over the whole life of the asset. So what are the key components of value for money? First of all, it's a combination of price and quality. Secondly, take into account risk. That has a value as well. And thirdly, the best value for money comes when you look at things on a whole life basis. And that's what we do in our projects. At the heart of our best PPP projects, you get the private sector with a responsibility for the design and the build and the maintenance over the whole life of the asset. And once you've got him responsible for building and constructing and he has money at risk, you're likely on a whole life basis to get a good value for money deal. So I'll do a little diagram to try and make this clearer. On this axis, we have got cost. And on this axis, we have got quality. Imagine that you are running a project to 
improve a river crossing. Now there are lots of different ways of crossing that river. You might have a boat, you might have a bridge, you might have an airport. All of these things have different costs and different qualities. So you get in a load of bits. If you're running this project you've probably got a cost parameter in mind, a price beyond which you cannot go. Everything to the right of that line is unaffordable. And there's probably a certain minimum quality that you need. Everything below that line is below the quality that you need. So the bids come in and some of them are very expensive and very high quality. Some of them are very cheap and very low quality. And what you have to come up with is the best combination of price and quality for your project, for the outcome that you want. So what you want to do is push all those bids in this direction and eventually you will find a sweet spot. You'll find anything above that line is gold plated, too high quality. Anything to the left of that line is a low ball bid which really is not going to deliver and you'll end up with a sweet spot in the middle and that's going to represent your best value for money. Around here bad value for money, inside here good value for money. So value for money at its heart is a combination of costs and quality. And the other thing about value for money is it's a comparative concept. Nothing is good or bad value for money on its own. The first Rolls Royce at £1,000 was not good or bad value for money on its own. Only by comparing it to other Rolls Royces can you say is it good or bad value for money. So the second great lesson about value for money is you have to compare it against different options. So what are the key ingredients of value for money? The key ingredients are price and quality, not just cheapest, and take into account risk transfer and whole of life. Um, and whether it's a car or a prison or a train or a hospital, those are the same key ingredients. So that's the concept. That's the concept of value for money. But value for money is a methodology. And we apply that methodology at different times in a transaction. The first time we apply it is at the beginning of the project when we look at all the different types of project option which we can do. Remember the river crossing? It could be a boat, it could be a plane, it could be a bridge. Each of these have different costs and each of these have different benefits. So let's draw our graph again. Along the bottom we've got our cost line as before. North south we've got the benefits. And you want to weigh up the cost of each of these options against the benefits that they, have, they offer. So the cost of a rowing boat is really small. Benefits pretty small as well. Cost of a bridge pretty high. Benefits pretty high. Once again, you end up getting lots of different bids and you have to find your sweet spot. For each one, you say, what is the cost-benefit ratio? And if the cost-benefit ratio is one to one, it's only just worth doing because the benefits are just about the same as the costs. So what you want is something which gives you a big cost-benefit ratio. So the cost-benefit ratio of flood to fence in London will be huge because if London floods, you know, we lose our homes, we lose our financial centre. So that's one of the things we do to test which project to do. <clears throat> The other test we do <coughs> of value for money is to test whether we should use private sector money or public sector money. Um, we test this in two different ways. Traditionally, we have a quantitative test, which is a mathematical test. People pretend it's a science. It's not, but people think it is. And it comes up with a number. <coughs> and we have a qualitative test, which has a set of qualitative test which lets us know is this the type of project which is likely to be suitable for private finance. So look at the quantitative model first. This is the one you'll all have heard of. It's a comparative concept. So what you're doing is you're comparing 
for cost of a traditionally financed project to a privately financed project. Most of it's the same. So you've got a build cost, pretty much the same. You've got operating costs, let's for the sake of argument say they're pretty much the same. And finally, you've got the cost of money. So the cost of money on the private sector side is higher than on the government. Private sector is more expensive than public sector. We really shouldn't be doing it. But we have to remember that a key part of the value for money equation is risk as well. And actually, the private sector is taking the risk of building this thing on time and on budget, of operating it and maintaining it for 30 years. And that is worth something, as in the car. So add that into the equation. There's the risk. And the private sector then looks better value for money than the public sector. Or it doesn't. And you end up like that. If it doesn't, don't use private sector value for money. That is the quantitative value for money test we apply on projects. Key thing, it's only as good as the data you put into it. This is not a scientific PASCO test. This is just a guide. You know the old adage, rubbish in, rubbish out. The data you get out is only as good as the data you put in. And if you don't have lots of accurate data about how much it costs to build and maintain a school in the public sector and how much in the private sector, you're not going to have a very accurate result. So I would say do not use this as a, as a pass-fail thing. Finally, and you'll be relieved to know we've only got two minutes to go to deal with the qualitative side of things. You can find our qualitative test on the Treasury website um, and uh, uh, the guidance reference will come up at the end. Um, what I would say is this is just a simple set of tests which we apply to any project where it's intended to use private finance. The sort of tests are, um, is there a long-term need for this project? Because if not, um, a private sector finance model is not very flexible. Is there a stable political requirement? Can you express your service simply in output specification terms. We haven't got time to go into what we mean by all these different tests, but they're up there on the Treasury website. You can very easily access them. And I would say to you that after 15, 20 years of doing these projects, we are very confident that these are good tests to apply. And if the answer to any of these tests are, is no, then probably you should be very wary of using private sector money to finance the project. There we go. Our time is up. I promised you within 15 minutes that you would become experts on value for money. And um, now you are. Thank you. This has been an Open Learning Campus presentation brought to you by the World Bank Group, accelerating solutions through learning.